Okay, so I guess we can start the session now. Um, <laughs> welcome to the session. Uh, we have, I think, about almost 50 attendees today. So it's big audience. <laughs> I hope we are ready for it. Um, so this session is, uh, is an industry-oriented session. And the theme of this uh, session is about, it's, is what are the future trends you see in the travel and tourism industry and how will these trends affect hiring? We have three panelists today. They're all experts from tourism related industries and I'm the moderator. Um, so the process uh, of this session uh, goes like this, uh, tentatively. <laughs> so we are going to explain the process now and then we are uh, going to introduce each of the panelists um, so after I read their bio, uh, each of the panelists will give, about, give a talk about five to 10 minutes on their thoughts on this topic. And, and then what you do one by one. So one bio reading, one talk, then one bio reading, one talk, and uh, reading and talk. And then we're going to open up the floor for questions. We have already got some questions in the conference app. And I also have a few questions prepared. And for the audience who want to post uh, new questions, please use the Q&A function in Zoom. And uh, we are able to, uh, as uh, the moderator and the panelists are able to see the questions. And if you choose your question, then your question will be visible to everybody. So if you don't see your question, you know, after you post it there, um, it's, uh, it's the way it's set up. Um, okay, so I think that's, um, that's what we are going to do today. Um, do, do, uh, do we have any questions from the panelists about the process? No, all good? Okay, good to see all of you. Okay, so uh, I'm Nina Shong. I'm a system professor in human dimension of natural resource department of Colorado State University. So my research, uh, I did lots of research in employee-based um, branding research. I do lots of research in organizational behavior. I look at how employees re react to different organizational practices. So hiring, training, communication, and retention, all of uh, all the things that I'm interested in. So I think it's a natural fit for me to moderate this session because I do have lots of questions too, uh, for the panelists as well. Um, so without further ado, we're well, we going to introduce each of the panelists. So we're going to start with Steve, then Andrew, then Toby. Okay, so I'm going to read the file provided to me. Uh, here. So our first panelist is Steve Hood. Steve Hood is Senior Vice President of Research for STR. He has been with STR for over 17 years and was involved in the original development of the STAR program. Steve played a major role in the historical launch of programs that incorporated daily, group, and transient and international data. He is currently responsible for research related activities at STR while helping to manage STR's relation, relationships with several major organizations. Steve also serves as the founding director of the SHARE Center, STR's outreach to universities around the world. He represents STR at national and international lodging and tourism conferences, and you can see his article in publications such as Hotel News Now. Steve serves on several advisory boards for industry and academia. In 2012, Steve was recognized by ICRI with the Industry Recognition Award for demonstrated commitment to advanced hospitality and tourism education. In 2013, he was named an honorary faculty member at the University of Delaware. Prior to STR, Steve served as vice president at two database consulting firms in the northern Virginia area. Steve grew up in the Baltimore, Washington area, received his undergraduate degree from the University of Maryland, and now lives in Nashville with his wife and four children. All right, so now let's welcome Steve to give us a brief talk on this topic. Great, thank you, Lena. Can everybody hear me okay? Perfect. Well, um, 
I wanted to back up a little bit and, and uh, sort of set the foundation for some of our conversations coming up. I'm a, I'm a little different because STR, you probably know, is is uh, the uh, sort of a, the leading source of hotel data. So let's let's think about what we've been through in the last couple of years. COVID hit in uh, 2020, March, April time frame, and, and obviously the hotel industry sort of crashed at that point in time. 2020 was the worst year in history as far as the hotel industry is concerned. And of course, you know, that had a major impact on workforce. Unfortunately, a lot of hotels had to cut workforce dramatically and and uh, that was not certainly a fun situation um you know we track the workforce numbers um many of those people you know most you know many many of those people have come back but the you know if you look at both rest you know if you look at hospitality in general and, and you, you focus you know i mean you, you combine restaurant with hotel you know the industry is still short a million workers and uh so that is a big number and of course that's had major impacts uh hotels had to close restaurants because they just couldn't staff them and even now you know hotels uh, i mean most hotels uh, you know and, and this is different things have happened in different parts of the world but a lot of hotels had to close now in like places in europe the government forced hotels to close, so it wasn't an option. But you know, uh, in other situations, hotels closed to restaurants because they didn't have staff. And and but now, you know, if if you don't have enough staff, for example, to clean the room, then that has a major implication. You to think about it. You have a revenue manager. If you're in a hundred room hotel, you're used to being able to sell a hundred rooms. But now that revenue manager is on the phone to the housekeeping saying, how many are we going to have to clean? Yeah, how many clean rooms are we going to have tonight? And it's and it's a totally different. So a lot of operational differences. And of course, the uh, the implications for staffing that then, of course, the hotels had to get them all back. And, you know, a lot of them weren't coming back. A lot of them, you know, they got a, a job at Amazon or they got a job somewhere else. And like, no, no, thanks. Uh, don't uh, don't need that anymore. Um, but it's interesting to see that the hotel companies had have, have had to be much more creative in order to get the people back. They had to wait. Well, first of all, they had to raise the wa uh, wages. And, and that was a big thing. And that was good, good for students, of course. And uh, but then they had to get much more creative. And and um, uh, I, I was in a conference recently where Joe Pine was talking. Joe Pine wrote that book, The Experience Economy, and his original book was on the customer experience. Well, he's written some things recently. Look up, search on the internet, and you'll find them related to the employee experience. And what do what do uh, uh, hotel, what, what do companies, hospitality companies, hotel tourism type companies have to do to, in, to improve the experience of the employee? And, that, and that's a whole nother um, topic and issue that's become important. But just to, just to finish up, one, one thing that I think, you know, one of the biggest trends we saw coming out of COVID, you know, everybody was locked up in their homes. Finally, they were able to get out, but, you know, they didn't feel safe to go to the big cities anymore. What did they do? They headed outdoors. And that was the exciting thing that's especially relevant to 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 you guys and, and to our other panelists. You know, I, I they they went to the mountains. They went to not not every beach. You know, they didn't go to Miami Beach too crowded. Where'd they go? And I thought I, it was funny. I was talking to kids in uh, China. I said, you haven't even heard the popular beaches right now. It's Myrtle Beach. It's watercolor. It's, you know, no way. And and and, you know, it's not Orlando, not Disney World anymore. It's Gatlinburg and it's Breckenridge. And but those places, I mean, you know, there were a lot of bright spots in the midst of a pandemic. And and there were hotels that were totally sold out and raised rates. You know, it's like I, I've been on panels before with you know, some of these GMs, it's like we kept raising rates and, and we kept filling up, you know, and 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 uh, and that was the case in Sanya. I know some of you are in, from China. Sanya in 2020 broke all the 2019 records. So here is a resort, a hot resort destination in China that in the midst of a pandemic had a great 2020 relatively and uh, and but it was that way all over the world Sochi in Russia Perth and Darwin in in Australia Bournemouth in in the UK 
everywhere experienced the same thing we did. And, and, and that's, uh, you know, that's especially relevant for you guys and, and, you know, so many of the uh, uh, emphasis uh, uh, on, on outdoor tourism and natural tourism that was in everywhere, everywhere had that same type of experience. And people, you know, it gained a whole new level of respect. People saw, hey, this is, you know, this is an important aspect of the hotel industry, the tourism industry that's been, you know, underestimated or undervalued. And and I still remember the the head of tourism for Vail, somebody asked him how, how, I think this was the 2020 winter season. He said, yeah, it was really good. It was, you know, it was good. But 21 summer was supposed to break all the records. Why? Because people wanted to go somewhere like Vail and and out get outdoor, go hiking and stay away from the big cities and they felt safe. And, and so whole new respect for uh, outdoor tourism, which I, I personally think is incredibly exciting because that's a passion for me. Awesome. Thank you very much, Steve. That's very informative. Um, and thank you for using the cases in China, because we do have uh, several attendees from our programs in China right now, and it's like midnight over there. So they must be excited to hear from you. Okay, so we move on to the next panelist. Uh, as I mentioned before, we are going to open up the floor for questions after all of the three panelists have talked. Okay, so our second speaker is Andrew Grossman. Uh, let me, okay. Andrew Grossman has been with the Colorado Tourism Office for over two years as the Director of Destination Development within the Colorado Office of Economic Development and International Trade. Prior to this position, he climbed the ranks at Travel Oregon from Destination Development Coordinator to Destination Management Specialist, and finally, Destination Development Manager. With this experience and his prior experience at Sustainable Tourism International, Grossman knows all the ins and outs of destination development in Colorado and beyond. Now um, we're moving to Andrew. Hey, good morning, everybody. How's it going? This is Andrew, as we just heard, Director of Destination Development for the Colorado Tourism Office. Um, I think a great place to start is what is the Colorado Tourism Office, um, but also I really appreciate the opportunity to kind of share. So we are the Destination Marketing and Management Organization for the state of Colorado. Um, we exist as a division within the Office of Economic Development and International Trade. We, we call that OEDIT. It sounds robotic. I swear I'm a human. Um, and we're also a office of the governor here in the state of Colorado. Um, and our mission is to achieve and sustain a healthy Colorado economy that works for everyone and protects what makes Colorado the best state in the country to live, work, start a business, raise a family and retire. Um, as I mentioned, I'm the director of destination development. As we heard, I used to work for Travel Oregon. Um, I will give credit to that organization. They invented the concept of destination development. Um, what does it mean? I think it's a weird term, so I'll kind of break it down. Um, I think when people think of organizations like the Colorado Tourism Office, they look at things like Colorado.com or Visit Colorado, which is our social media tag, or the official state visitors guide, or our 10 welcome centers. Um, and in many ways, what we do is we inspire travel to and within the state of Colorado um, in order to drive economic development, in order to enhance residential quality of life, and also build awareness and appreciation for the assets that make our competitive advantage as a tourism destination. I don't do any marketing in my role. Um, and in fact, a lot of what I have the fortunate opportunity to do is I work with uh, different destination organizations. So um, we're at the state level, but you know, Visit Fort Collins is a fantastic partner that I can work with, or Visit Durango. So a lot of the Visit X organizations um, is a great way to think about the folks that I get to work with. Or it's the tourism industry associations, whether it be Bicycle Colorado, whether it be what we call liquid arts associations, which would be kind of the Colorado Association of Viticulture and Enology, or K, which is the wine association. Um, and what I get to do is work with those folks to make sure that we can advance tourism in a way that delivers on the expectation of the benefit of traveling to and within the state of Colorado. Um, you know, I know we're here to talk a little bit about workforce. So I think it's always helpful to know, you know, how did I get here? And shameless plug, I think you should all work in the tourism industry if you're here attending. We we need you now more than ever, <laughs> I'll be honest. Um, but I do think that kind of the realm of 
destination marketing and management organizations or destination organizations is sort of an, we exist behind the curtain, um, to be honest with you. I think it's a really exciting industry to have an opportunity to work in. Um, if you look at, you know, what it is to travel or be a part of the tourism economy, you know, people, we deliver experiences. Um, I think people don't really acknowledge or appreciate how much work goes into the, the delivery of experiences. Um, whether it be frontline staff at a hotel, whether it be frontline staff at a restaurant, whether it be GMs at any of those places, um, transportation providers, airline pilots. I mean, we all collectively work together to make sure that people have a good time. Um, and if you work in destination marketing and management, you're sort of the wizard behind the curtain. So I really encourage people that may not know about, you know, this side of the industry to really take a deep look into it. Um, there's a lot of really cool opportunities how did I get here, though? I know I chatted a little bit with the folks that are running this. Um, you know, I took a pretty un non-traditional path. Uh, I graduated college and went to New Zealand and was an organic farmer for six months and then ended up in France as a beekeeper and then learned a lot about the value of apprenticeships and ended up taking an unpaid internship in Oregon uh, for a company called Sustainable Travel International that got me into the tourism industry. I started selling carbon offsets and here I am at a state tourism office. So, you know, I think non-traditional paths are kind of exciting ways to look at each of your futures. So I encourage you to kind of follow your passion because that's one way to get ahead, but also leave yourself open to, you know, other, other, other avenues as well. So what's going on in Colorado <laughs> from a tourism lens? I know obviously that's what I'm here to talk about. Um, you know, we heard a little bit from kind of Steve about kind of what I would maybe consider kind of macro, macro COVID, COVID impacts. Um, here in Colorado, we break up the state into eight travel regions. Um, if you are in Fort Collins, um, you're in the Denver and the city of the Rockies travel, travel region. Um, COVID was extremely detrimental to the industry, as I'm sure everybody is well aware. Um, I think, you know, we were about $2.4 billion industry in 2019, and we went down to $15.8 billion in 2020, we're back up to 22, I think 0.1 right now. Um, as of 2021, um, we do commission an economic impact study on the state of tourism every year since 2012 that looks at visitor spending, employment, earnings, as well as kind of tax revenue. You can find that on annual tourism research on the economic development website. So, oh, edit that, that robotic term that I mentioned. Um, but what's really fascinating about Colorado, and again, I'm kind of just building on Steve's Steve comments a little bit, is that it wasn't uniform in the way that COVID impacted our state. Um, you know, we look at by county, to be honest with you, as a great kind of metric for us. And the western side of the state is above 2019 levels, and the eastern side of the state is below 2019 levels. That's not black and white, um, but I would say that's the best way to kind of Kind of describe it of the four travel regions four of them are up over 2019 four of them are still down from from 2019 um and when i think about you know tourism destinations we look at butler's life cycle if you're not familiar with it i strongly encourage you to look at it from I think it 1980s or so before i was born but you know still still important but what i do is i I compartmentalize it myself. I think there's six stages to the butler life cycle um i look at kind of the first two and i call that emerging the next two, I call that intermediate, and the top two, I call that established. Um, if you're an emerging destination, you're looking at visitor readiness. If you're in an intermediate destination, you're looking at visitor experience. If you're an established destination, you're looking at visitor management. Um, you know, and that's a good kind of lens because that's a big part of what people need right now. Uh, depending on where they are on the life cycle, those are kind of the avenues through which they operate. There's also a bunch of different, I'd say, priorities right now um, within that lens that people are activating on. Things like advancing off-peak tourism, things like advancing tourism workforce, building awareness of the value of tourism, developing and enhancing visitor experience, and fostering inclusive travel, promoting local businesses and experiences. This is all what you know the partners that I get to work with are kind of thinking about right now. Um, a primary gap is workforce, obviously. So I'll just kind of jump, jump into that one. I think there are some systemic challenges to workforce that are outside of the control of the Colorado Tourism Office. Things like affordable housing is a major issue for certainly our mountain towns, but frankly, across across the country. Um, I think that even just, you know, building awareness of the value of a job within tourism. So again, shameless plug, please join our industry. <laughs> um, but definitely kind of building awareness of the, 
the you know the escalator, if you will, to becoming a kind of frontline staff all the way to a GM. It's one of the few industries that you can get a huge kind of career bump without the need for continued education because you'll get it through on on, on the job experience. Um, but I do think there's a huge opportunity for organizations like the Colorado Tourism Office and our partners to, you know, foster a more inclusive community of workforce across the state. Um, there's a fantastic program um, that used to exist. I think what's funny is I hear about all these things that happened 10 years ago that stopped that everybody wants to get back. So I challenge myself. I don't think there's new ideas. I think we just rehash old ideas and make them make them new again. Um, but a really cool cool program that I heard about is it's called like a customer service token program. So the visitor centers in destinations can um, give a little coin to visitors when they arrive. And if they have a good customer service experience, they can give that to the frontline staff um, that gave them a good customer service experience. And then they can get a discount at a local restaurant in order to help afford um, the ability to kind of experience what visitors do in these more expensive mountain communities. I think there's ways to look at like service industry night by turning it into tourism industry night in areas, you know, how can we get discounts to things like the fabulous hot springs that we have in the state to create a little, you know, culture around it? Because I do think it is sometimes challenging to move to a tourism destination, you know, find yourself in an affordable housing situation as a new resident and not be able to kind of meet people. Um, what can we do as tourism to really foster that more inclusive environment and frankly, create the delivery of experiences that we're so good at to visitors? Um, why aren't we doing that to residents in our workforce? So I'll leave you all with that. Again, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. Um, I look forward to your questions. Awesome, thank you, Andrew. Um... I have lots of questions, so uh, I'll wait. Uh, now we are moving to the last panelist, Toby Bloom. Toby Bloom is an expert in protected area public lands management, sustainable tourism, recreation economics, sorry, economies, and environmental interpretation. She has 21 years of experience in tourism enterprise development and interpretation project design and implementation in the US and 16 countries in Latin America, the Caribbean and Africa, pioneer in bringing health and well-being programs to the national forest system. Bloom is also an expert in establishing partnership and pro problem solving with national and local governments, NGOs, and communities. Sustainable tourism project design, capacity building, program management, environmental interpretation, curriculum de development, and training delivery, community enterprise development in high biodiversity areas, international interpretation, <laughs> guiding and guide training, expertise in financial and project management, oral presentation, technical writing, and new business development. She is a certified climate change professional, certified nature and forest therapy guide, certified interpretive train trainer, certified interpretive guide, certified green global consultant, proficient in macro. Soft office fluency in English and Spanish. <laughs> wow. <laughs> All right. So now let's move to um. Let's um. Toby, would you? Uh, sure, <laughs> Lena. Wow, that was uh my whole resume. Thank you. I think that was pulled from LinkedIn, but great. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, after that long list, my current title is the I'm the national program manager for travel, tourism, and interpretation for the US Forest Service. And so I work for the American people um, and I work for our federal government. And uh, it was very interesting to hear what Steve and Andrew had to say because all of our experiences kind of piggyback on each other. And what Steve was saying about how, you know, hotels really shut down and suffered. Well, they were coming to us on the national forests. And so while most tourism uh, industry sectors saw a massive slump in visitation over COVID, we saw massive increases in visitation. Uh, we went up to 168 million visitors uh, in 2021. Um, it was a huge, it was about a 12% bump from where we had been. And it was like every weekend was the 4th of July on pretty much every national forest and grassland. And so uh, our impact was realizing that we needed a lot more staff. Um, folks were coming to spend their time outdoors on the national forests and grasslands. 
And over the past 20 years, the Forest Service had really reduced the number of recreation staff that were serving visitors. And you know, internally, we, we saw this as a problem uh, and a challenge that we needed to really address. And you know, nobody would have signed up for COVID, but it really shined a light on the importance of providing good visitor services and customers, you know, experiences when people come to the national forests. And so right now in the Forest Service, we are actually going through a hiring surge where we are trying to beef up um, our recreation staff and make sure we have more. We're about to start a, a new five-year re-envisioning plan for recreation on the national forests, um, including you know, investing in new staff, re-engaging with some partners that uh, maybe we hadn't been paying as much attention to in the past, um, and really kind of putting recreation as uh, a top priority with the agency. And I hope that we will continue that. Um, we are a multi-use agency, which means that in addition to recreation, we also um, have partnerships and contracts with uh, private industry where we allow mineral extraction from some of our lands. Uh, we lease our lands out to telecommunications companies so that they can put their uh, power lines and communication lines across national forests. Uh, we also um, are home to 60% of the ski resorts in the United States. So we partner with all of those private companies that run the ski resorts. Uh, we also manage um, the most uh, sources of fresh water in the United States. So while we're balancing all of these extractive um, uses and recreational uses, we are also making sure that we're protecting the environment and making sure that folks have safe, clean drinking water, um, that habitats for a lot of our wildlife uh, stay intact and can continue to grow. Uh, so it's a lot to balance. But um, like I said, you know, the importance of recreation really came to light during COVID. Uh, so it has been very interesting, and I will say that right now, I'm usually, I'm based in Washington, D.C. at our headquarters, and I live and work in Washington, D.C., land of the Anacostchank uh, tribe. Uh, and today, I am actually in California on the uh, Rincon Reservation of the Rincon Band of Luceno Indians at the American Indian Tourism Conference. And so that is another sector that I think is really interesting to talk about because before COVID, um, tourism to what we refer to as Indian country in the United States was the fastest growing segment of tourism. Uh, tourism was always a pretty uh, strong sector in the US, but while tourism, I think in 2019 was growing at maybe 2%, 3%, uh, travel to Indian country was raised, was increasing by about 5% a year. And so we really saw a lot of interest, mostly from international travelers, uh, to come and learn about our, um, our native cultures. Um, COVID obviously impacted everybody and it uh, acutely impacted our tribes that had less access to um, medical care and kind of basic infrastructure. And so they are still rebounding from the effects of COVID. And to be honest, as a tourism industry, COVID's not over yet. We still don't know where we're going to land at the end of this. And so I think um, we are all looking to be creative and agile. That is really something that COVID has taught us. And I think the other big thing that we are still learning as an industry is, as Steve mentioned, you know, the need to be creative and really provide meaningful benefits to folks that we want to bring on to our staff. For the Forest Service, uh, we are lucky because the meaningful benefits are kind of built into the job. Uh, I always say that people don't uh, join the Forest Service to get rich. Uh, you do it because you get to work in some of the most beautiful places in the country. And so we do find that people are gravitating towards this work. Uh, you know, a major crisis really uh, forces people or allows people to explore their values and decide what is really important to them. Time with their family is important, time in nature, um, time to reflect, uh, work that fulfills you. And we have that in spades. And so, uh, you know, of course, we have our own issues with bureaucracy and hiring and how long it takes to bring on staff or how long it takes to actually, you know, get a position advertised. 
But once we do that, we find that folks that come to work for the Forest Service and the other public land management and water management agencies, they're doing it because of, the, of that fulfillment factor. And so we're seeing that a lot right now with our hiring. Uh, another big thing that we're seeing, you know, that focus on kind of smaller scale destinations. Uh, we're seeing that in our national forests, there's a program that's uh, that started in the United States called Recreate Responsibly. And um, they had a campaign, I think it was back in February of this year that was called Share the Love. And it was really about providing alternatives to those kind of iconic destinations because people were looking for places to visit that weren't packed to the hilt. Uh, and so they came to us and said, you know, what are the four, where are the forests that we should send people? And I said, well, you know, we're not really in the business of kind of marketing our forests. And right now, you know, we're a little short staffed. We're working on it, but rather than, you know, tell your visitors and send throngs of people to a specific forest, we'll tell you where we have available campgrounds. Uh, and believe it or not, a lot of our campgrounds, and we are the majority of the lodging and reservation facilities that are available on recreation.gov, that has all of the reservable assets of all of those federal agencies, we have the majority of those. And an awful lot of those are booked out six months in advance, which is when the reservations open up. So we've been seeing that our lesser visited campgrounds are now getting more visitation and our gateway communities that are just outside of the national forests and grasslands are getting unprecedented visitation that they never had before. Um, while there was you know, a major slump in international visitation, domestic tourism to outdoor spaces, like I said, was huge during COVID. And so a lot of these communities that were, in addition to kind of seeing the economic impacts of COVID, we also know that a lot of rural communities in the United States, and this may be the case in your country as well, have a tendency to rely on maybe one employer in the community. It could be a large university or it could be, um, you know, a timber mill or a land, a, a mine or something like that. And when those big employers shut down, these communities are kind of left without um, the normal economic drivers that they've had in the past. And so we are now as an agency trying to focus outside the boundaries of the national forests and really work with our gateway communities to make sure that they are prepared for visitation. And this was actually reflected in the US National Travel and Tourism Strategy, which was released in June of this year. Um, the first National Travel and Tourism Strategy was released in 2012. So it was about 10 years and we released this one. And if you are ever with, you know, a few hours of free time and you want to read through the National Travel and Tourism Strategy, you will notice that the focus uh, has really shifted on, you know, what we're trying to achieve. And so the 2012 strategy, which was really about, you know, heads and beds and number of dollars spent and how much um, foreign exchange are we generating by tourism, the 2022 version of the National Travel and Tourism Strategy focused a lot more on destination stewardship, on building capacity within communities to really provide a good experience and reap the benefits of having all of these visitors in your community uh, and supporting small communities in their tourism endeavors. So we are seeing these shifts towards more of a focus uh, to smaller communities and to individual fulfillment. And so that is with our hiring and also with the work that we're doing with our local communities. So I'll leave it there. Great, thank you, Toby. Okay, so thank, uh, thank to you all, all of the uh, panelists. Um, those are very informative, great, uh, great talks. So ne uh, next, we are going to move to question and answers. I pre have prepared a few questions. I think Emily is going to um, share with us the questions uh, uh, attendees raised in the conference app as well as uh, in Zoom. I, I guess. Okay, so I'm going to start um, some of the questions here on my end. Um, so first I want to um, ask the question to Steve. Um, this is um, this is more, I guess, concerning uh, the situation in China. Um, the, pan the impact of a pandemic in, you know, in other, you say in the U.S., in Europe, it's can come and go, come and go. But in China, it's a very different situation because in the past two years, it's a zero COVID policy. Um, you know, 
lockdown in local areas almost immediately. Um, so I'm just wondering if you see any particu particularity in the hotel data you got from China during this past couple of years, and also share with us, you know, what do you see, uh, what will be the future growth area? Yeah, no, that's a really good point, Lena. And, and China has really had a tough time. If you, uh, and you guys were all there, so you remember, and you know, China went down in February where everybody else went down in March. So China hit bottom and bottom in China was about 10% uh, occupancy. So way below normal uh, in, uh, and that happened in February, by the end of February. And, but then, you know, interestingly enough, uh, the recovery, the 2020 recovery in China was looking great. I mean, by October, by the holidays in October, I think it's golden week. You guys can help me on the Chinese holidays, but golden week in October, it was back to 2019 levels. Act, there were days during that week long holiday that actually surpassed the same days in 2019. So everybody thought, okay, China's recovered. Everybody else is going to go and take the China direction. Well, then we went into 2021 and then we hit had Delta and Delta went down and, and that was unfortunate. And then we had Omicron and Omicron went down and then we had regional outbreaks. Remember we had the outbreak in Nanjing and that was pretty localized, but then we had the outbreak in Hainan and that was not localized. That it hit every, you know, hit everywhere. And since then it's really, 2022 has been a roller coaster and, and it's been up and down and up and down. And I think we're, you know, I've lost track. I used to count waves. Uh, I think we're on wave eight, but uh, don't quote me on that. And uh, and it's been hard. And uh, it's you know it's but uh, but you know people are you know we're 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 optimistic that it's you know that we're around the corner. Of course, the restrictions in Hong Kong got removed what three weeks ago. That was good news, and and uh, people were excited about that. And and so you know we're hoping. Um, that uh, restrictions are going to be lifted sometime soon, and and uh, of course that's going to bring things back. And and uh, but it has certainly been challenging. Uh, our folks, you know, we have we have about twenty folks in China, or twenty staff in China, and and uh, you know they're they've uh, they they're they're hoping to travel again. And uh, you know the travel in China has been domestic. It, you know there have I, as I said there've been some bright spots, but. Um, yeah, but but we're just waiting. Yeah, I, you know, I, I remember looking at things, gosh, in 21, it looked like Shanghai was coming back. You know, there were some, you know, for a couple months, there were some real positive notes and even Beijing was coming back and, and uh, but it's really been a roller coaster. That's a type of data, you know, for, uh, and, and Lena knows this, you know, we'd be more than glad to share that kind of data with you, let you analyze that more closely. And honestly, you know, there have not been professors and students that have been really analyzing that data and tearing it apart and trying to figure out when, you know, the industry right now, when they're looking at that data, they're trying to compare how are the luxury hotels doing the, the economy hotels and how, how are weekday business comparing to weekend business and group business, you know, and, and, uh, and it's very, di you know, it's very different in different areas of the world. I'm right now I'm in the ne Netherlands and I just shared at a conference and the trends in Europe, you know, there were certain trends in Europe that were accident, uh, you know, exactly opposite to the trends in the U.S. And and so, you know, same in Asia Pac, and and so it's very important. And of course, that's what we're all about. And uh, analyzing the data, being able to understand that students, if if you can get hands-on experience working with the data, you are gonna really have, uh, you're gonna really stand out when you go to interview at a company, whether it's in China or anywhere. You're gonna stand out if you have the ability to analyze data and 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 figure out you know, strategic decisions based upon that, so. Yeah, thank you. I, I, I love that idea. Um, you know, the future, future, employable, attractive job skills to have. And I think data analytics, being able to tell a story from dry data is, is really something, um, something desirable for companies. Yeah, thank you very much, Steve. And my next question is uh, for Andrew. So you mentioned that, uh, you know, your job is kind of behind the curtain. Um, so just to give some more context to the attendees. So um, could you tell us what is the most exciting part of your job? And, and, <laughs> and also, um, 
do you think that that exciting part will apply to attract future workforce, you know, to work in Colorado with all the, you know, living costs rising and um, other issues in the mountains? So I want to hear about your perspective on this. Oh, well, yeah. So people ask me, what do I like about my job? So I feel like that's kind of what what I just got asked. Um, I feel really fortunate. You know, as I mentioned, I work for state government within the governor's office, but um, I have the opportunity to innovate every single day, which I think is really unique um, working in working in government. I do credit the state of Colorado for that opportunity and the way that they look at, I think, the need to think outside the box and identify um, tangible, actionable solutions to the complex world that, you know, this panel's had a brief opportunity to kind of dive, dive into. Um, I think outside of that, you know, I'm, I'm here in Uray, although it looks like I'm in Crested Butte and Columbines, I'm actually surrounded by snow right now. Uh, we got a total dump <laughs> this morning, so who knows if I'll get back to Denver tonight. Um, but we just hosted a workshop um, with 30 different attendees and all representing different sectors of the tourism industry here in URA. And I would argue they're more on kind of the established side of the destination life cycle that I, that I alluded to. So we're looking at things like visitor management, um, which is another way of saying, how do we make more visitors feel like less, which is another way of saying, how do we encourage responsible and respectful use? Um, and we're also looking at advancing off-peak tourism to really extend the season in a way that can provide um, kind of a stronger and more mm. robust tourism economy um, while also providing more um, consistent workforce opportunities and as well as wages. So that's the kind of conversation that we were having. Um, I think it's a it's a unique challenge that, you know, folks like I have where we bring people into a room. Um, some of my friends, um, I won't say where from because I don't want to call them out, but um, we have this term called Kind of same 10 people or STP. Um, some of you might know Stone Temple Pilots. It's a different term for the acronym, but a lot of these, you know, rural communities across Colorado and frankly, the country, um, and again, my lens of understanding is Western US states, you know, we have really passionate community members that wear multiple hats, um, whether they be the mayor that also runs the barbecue place and also, you know, host the event center. Um, you know, these are the people that power the communities that we all want to travel to. And we've heard a lot about, you know, that again from the panel. Um, they're tired, frankly, I'll be honest with you. Um, you know, as we mentioned, tourism industry has been completely decimated from, from COVID and we're coming back, but just economic development isn't the best factor anymore for measuring success. I think we're looking at qualitative benefits as well. And how much can we rely on the you know goodwill of volunteers is I think a question I have all the time. So being able to show up to a place and convene these folks that are passionate, um, but they need a third party facilitator, and then they share feedback like, um, you know, we've been in these rooms for thirty years and we finally feel optimistic. You know, that's a that's a huge, it's a great thing to hear, but it's also you know I tell my consultants I go good luck, <laughs> don't mess this one up, you know. Um, so I think, you know, that's that's certainly an exciting thing. And, you know, and, and, and you know, I, I keep coming back to the fact that I think people think that we are, you know, marketing organizations, which truly is a key component of us, but we're also placemaking organizations. Um, we, you know, we are a sustainable industry. You know, you look at a lot of areas that transition to tourism, you know, they're transitioning from extractive industry. You know, a lot of place, places like Chafee County, for example, which is mind boggling to me that, that that wasn't seen as a world-class tourism destination for its entire existence. Only in the last 15 years has kind of come to prominence. It was seen as a mining town. Um, so post-extractive turns into tourism. Um, it's a way to kind of keep communities alive. It's a way to enhance quality of life. There's health and wellness benefits from things like we heard Toby talk about from, you know, public lands and how can we protect them? So, you know, Shameless plug, please join our industry. We need you. <laughs> <laughs> Great. I hope you will receive some resumes after today's session. Uh, the next question is for Toby. Um, so thank you for that talk regarding uh, U.S. Forest Service. I'm glad that there's a you know, huge increase uh, of visitation to those places, although it becomes a capacity problem as well. You also mentioned that you're looking at a five-year reimagination of hiring. 
um, that with the heroin search. So I'm just wondering if do you think um, you mentioned that you hope this was you know be sustainable, but I'm just wondering how likely will this um, hiring be you know continu continuous uh, in the next few years? Because um, considering post COVID situations, um, so just want to hear your opinion on that. Yeah, I think that's a really good question. Um, you know, the the winds of change blow pretty regularly in terms of politics, and uh, a lot of our direction comes from whatever you know is the current administration. And so right now there is a lot of focus on equity and uh, making sure that the ranks of the Forest Service look like the American public. So we're really looking at um, you know bringing in a lot of young people, a more diverse crowd. Um, we have had trouble uh, retaining uh, diverse employees in the past, and we're really taking a good hard look at why that is and what we can do to change it. Um, but, uh, you know, the interesting thing about the Forest Service is that we do not have any political appointees within our ranks. Uh, the only person in the Forest Service that is appointed is the chief of the Forest Service. And that person always comes from within the ranks of the Forest Service. So we don't have any outsiders or political appointees that come in and sort of drastically shift the direction that the forest is that the forests are going in. The other thing that really benefits us is that recreation is a very bipartisan topic. Um, everybody loves the outdoors. And so uh, you look at a bill like the Great American Outdoors Act that passed um, in, I think it was 2020, uh, under the Trump administration, which a lot of people don't sort of view the Trump administration as being friendly to the environment. Uh, but this was a really great bill that um, put a dent in our infrastructure maintenance backlog. So the Forest Service and the Park Service, a lot of our infrastructure has been around since the 1950s and 60s. And because of reduced budgets and you know reductions in recreation staff, we really haven't been able to maintain those facilities. And so part of this bill was about, um, you know, providing funding to our agency, to park service, to fish and wildlife, to uh, improve our facilities and really modernize them. Uh, and so we have a lot of folks joining us because of that. And that also gave us a lot of exposure to new uh, groups and organizations that would work with us in order to improve that infrastructure. And so I think while policy changes, um, once you build relationships and once you kind of open certain Pandora's boxes, those things don't close down. And so when people reconnected with nature during COVID, that's not something that you turn away from. Um, I find specifically in my work as a forest therapy guide that nature is kind of like, uh, you know, what if you, you were hungry and you didn't know that eating food was the thing that would, would satisfy you. I feel that way about nature. A lot of people didn't realize that that was the thing that they were hungry for. And so by default, because the bowling alleys and the movie theaters and the salons and spas were all closed for two years, people turned to nature because they didn't really have anything else to do. And they discovered how important it was for their well-being. So while you know trends come and go, I think this rediscovery of our connection with nature is something that sticks with people. And so I'm optimistic uh, that these trends will continue. And again, like I said, you know, we're not going to unlearn the fact that we need better recreation services. On the contrary, this has just gotten a lot more focus uh, as we continue to go through the years. Right now, there's a bill in front of Congress called America's Outdoor Recreation Act uh, that will mm. continue to help us improve our facilities and continue to hire and continue mm. to work with our local communities. And again, this national travel and tourism strategy that came out, those usually last about 10 years, which is a pretty long lifetime uh, for certain objectives that we got within that document. Uh, we also codified a federal interagency council on outdoor recreation. And so that will last past any administration. Um, you know, things can change, but when you establish um, infrastructure and networks, usually those can stand the test of time. And so I'm hopeful that that's going to be what happens as we move through, you know, as we're seeing all of these great developments for recreation economies and local community tourism. Yeah, yeah, that, that sounds very promising. And that definitely makes sense. And also go back, going, if we, sorry, Steve, uh, I just want to mention that, you know, going back to a destination life cycle, Butler <laughs> mentioned by Andrew. Right. Um, 
yeah, even if um, mm, like if at the end of the life cycle, destination is still going to reinvent and rejuvenate. So it's always other ways to go above and the shift from quantity to quality. I think it's something we, we need to also think about, you know, different measurement of success. And even maybe, even if the hiring is not as um, in the grand scale in the future, but the skills you learn now and you know the future trends will definitely help you to even secure jobs in different industries because those skills will be very translatable. So absolutely. And, yeah. If, um, if maybe just to jump, jump in on that one, you know, I think, I think Butler was great at the time, um, but I, I, I do think it was missing some things, to be honest with you. I think there was a missing line at the top of right where you get to stagnation and it's missing carrying capacity because I think that's an assumed barrier that destinations reach. Um, it does talk about rejuvenation up at the top. And I think that's what you just mentioned, Lena, but it seems really kind of Malthusian, to be honest with you, that there's a static line of carrying capacity. And I think that's what you were getting at. Mm -hmm. But I do think we as destination engineers can, you know, it, create and kind of implement interventions that increase our carrying capacity. And I think that's kind of what is alluded to at the rejuvenation stage, but I wish I could yeah. just see the static line of carrying capacity go up mm -hmm. as we increase parking lots, as we create transportation systems, as we build workforce housing, as we increase the workforce. I mean, this is, this is where I think, you know, it's 40 years old at this point. So here we are in 2022. Yeah. <laughs> and that capacity also increases when you uh, create a more responsible traveler. Uh, mm -hmm. And that is a big trend that we're seeing right now, that when you go to a destination, Hawaii is like the champion of this. Anytime that you book an excursion or a tour or whatever, you sign a pledge that says that you will mm. respect the land and understand that you are a visitor and that you will you know, behave in the way that is expected of you. And I'm seeing this in so many other uh, destinations now. And I think it's really important um, in terms of carrying capacity, but it's also just important for our industry. I mean, mm. there is no tourism if we don't protect the places that people are visiting. And so if we can transfer some of that responsibility uh, to the visitor to make sure that they are visiting in a way that allows us to sustain these places, that helps us um, you know, sustain our visitation, increase visitation, and also makes the experience better for everybody. I just find mm -hmm. that in this day and age, if we can really um, encourage people to put themselves in somebody else's shoes, have an authentic experience in a community that you're visiting, understand what it's like to live in this town or you know, to work in this restaurant or whatever, it's just gonna be better for all of us. And so mm -hmm. part of that, you know, improving the destination uh, management and improving the experience and improving the amount of folks that we can have uh, has to do with also as an industry, our responsibility to inform our travelers and explain to them, you know, kind of best practices. Hmm. Steve, that, yeah. That's really great. I, I, Toby and Andrew, I really appreciate uh, that. You know what it made me think of um, from a hotel point of view, think about five, well, four, four or five years ago, what you heard from places like Barcelona and Venice you know, they were complaining about over tourism. So, you know, the folks in Barcelona actually cut hotel construction in midstream. And why? Because there were too many visitors in Barcelona. Venice, you saw signs up, you know, go home, stay away, you know. And you know, then COVID hit. And of course, you didn't hear any of those things anymore. But, you know, now outdoor tourism became the thing. And, uh, you know, and, and I appreciate what you, what you guys are thinking about your, your, your uh, mindset in terms of management. How do we do it right? And, and you know, I, I, I was in a, I was in a, uh, I was talking to people before about how, you know, now Venice and Barcelona have an opportunity for a do over, you know, when it does come back. And, and so I think it's critical for people like, you know, people in, the tourism organizations like this to figure out, you know, how do we do it right? And, uh, you know, how do we, you know, how do we educate the consumer like you were sharing, Toby, and, and, uh, and then, uh, you know, and, and, and make this, uh, you know, a, a high value, but a, you know, but, a but, a you know, sustainable uh, experience for everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Um, that's very cool. Great insights from the panelists. So we have about 20 minutes left from the session. So now I think we're going to take some questions from the audience. We'll start with the questions um, asked 
during the session. Then we are going to move to the questions posted in the conference app uh, before the session. Okay, so the first question is from Julia. Her question, her question is, thank you for this fantastic opportunity to learn from the panel. As a PhD student, study Intermountain Western Gateway residents' experiences during the pandemic, much of what you have shared resonates with what I'm hearing, seeing, and learning. I'm curious to learn if resident outreach and inclusion by the multiple organizations represented by this panel has been incorporated in tourism and natural resource management. If so, did you approach recovery? Did you, did your approach recovery strategies in ways specifically shaped by this resident inclusion? <laughs> Not sure if this question is uh, um, targeted. Yeah, I can I can at least start a response, okay. and I'll obviously lean on my fellow panelists to kind of go forward from there. You know, I think I mentioned, you know, I worked for a company called Sustainable Travel International, buzzword, 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 um, <laughs> back in 20, 2011. Um, and we, we were talking about things like destination stewardship, and then we called it regenerative travel, then we called it transformational <laughs> travel. And, you know, I feel like, I feel like, and again, I work for the government, so I feel like I can say this, I feel like consultants come up with a new word for community-based tourism every two years to get another contract, I'll be honest with you. So to me, it's all community-based tourism. And that's just really what, what, what I do. And I feel like is another way to say what we're, we're doing. I, I think I'm going to buy, maybe I shouldn't tell this publicly, but I'm going to buy the URL destinationlegacy.com and I'm going to start destination legacy plans in two years. I bet that's going to be the next one, you know? Um, but, you know, absolutely. I mean, if you look at community-based tourism, you put community and residents at the center of decision-making. And I think a lot of the critiques, and I think they're valid critiques of the tourism industry, is that residents don't feel like they've been consulted in the way that their destination and community gets promoted and the way that it gets consumed by, by visitors. And I think that there's a huge opportunity for, you know, everyone here <laughs> and, you know, adjacent to us to really consult our residents to understand what their values are and make sure that we accurately promote destinations in a way that our community wants to be promoted. Um, you can't please everybody, but input is extremely important and reaching out the olive branch is extremely important even if people don't respond. I think I tell my partners all the time, you know, if people have a critique that you're not listening to them and you're not asking for their opinion, that's an extremely valid critique. So I built resident sentiment surveys into every single program that I do. Um, we got we did 23 last year. We got 6,275 responses. We also do tourism stakeholder surveys as well. Um, we do visitor profile studies. We do background research. We meet with core teams. Um, if we're not acknowledging the input from residents, we're going to get defunded. I'll jump in on this one as well. Yeah, I mean, it certainly is impacting the way that we do our work. Um, in, in my sort of sphere of work, we talk about recreation economies rather than tourism because recreation is kind of the word that the public land management agencies use. We talk about recreation. And it wasn't until recently that I and my colleagues at the other agencies have really been able to drive home to our agencies that we are part of the tourism industry, whether we plan that way or not. And we have had much better outcomes uh, planning what goes on in the forest and what goes on in the communities with input from those communities. And, you know, part of the way that we manage our lands and it's written into the laws for our agency is that we have to do consultation with our communities. And any time that there is major infrastructure or changes on a national forest, there is an open period of comment. Uh, whenever there is sort of a NEPA review, which is national environmental policy, um, any American has the ability to weigh in on this and talk about the land and what they would like to see and what they would not like to see. So it's really in our DNA as an agency, but it's only recently that we've been doing it from a tourism planning perspective and doing it outside the boundaries of the forest, but it has been wildly successful. Uh, we have a program that we run with EPA called Recreation Economies for Rural Communities. And this is a program that doesn't give any funding at all. It's just a series of three workshops with local communities and the federal and state land management and water management agencies and whatever other sort of natural resource managers, managers and community planners we can get in the room. 
And the program is wildly successful. The first year of the program was in 2019. Uh, and they were able to fund 10, pro they got 170 applications. That's 170 communities around the country that want to sit down together and make the determination about what tourism in their community is going to look like. The program was wildly successful. We just launched, um, we, we closed the proposals for 2022. Um, the funding was increased so that we were able to fund 25 communities this year instead of 10. And you know that is a result of these workshops being very successful and communities feeling very empowered. Um, if you do a government program and it's a flop, like Andrew was saying, you don't get funded again. And if you do a program that's popular with everybody, you get more funding. And so that's what happened with this program. And like I said, we don't give them a dime. You know, it's just this series of workshops, but it's the ability to really infuse you know your opinion and and have the community come together and decide what tourism looks like where they are and of course you know once you have a plan like that it's much easier to get grants and business services and and you know move down the line of developing your tourism but it shows the strength of you know bringing a community together to really decide what their future is going to look like and do their own place making Great, thank you, Andrew and Toby. Uh, the next question uh, is from Sam. I'm hearing that you need employee students to join the industry. What opportunities are available and what does an application look like? I can tell you ours is very short. You can find all forest service jobs on usajobs.gov search for recreation. Uh, you can do a geographic search if you have a specific area that you'd like to work in. And I guarantee that there are recreation jobs available in the United States uh, at pretty much every level. Uh, so get out there, usajobs.gov. And that's not just for Forest Service, that's Park Service, Fish and Wildlife, uh, NOAA, the Marine Sanctuaries. So any of those federal public land agencies will have their jobs posted. Great. The next question from Marshall. As tourism leaders in a redefining industry, has there been a push to include indigenous peoples in the planning, development, and implementation of the mentioned trends in tourism? How did that partnership originate? And what types of engagement between the in entities takes place? Well, I'm being a mic hog today, uh, but <laughs> this is, you know, this is something that is very unique to the federal government. In the United States, um, all of the federally recognized tribes are considered sovereign governments. And so when we work with a tribe, it is a government to government relationship. And yes, we have been noticing this trend. Um, like I said, you know, travel to Indian country in the United States was the fastest growing sector of the tourism economy before COVID. And then um, we also have, there is a bill uh, that was passed in 2016 called the NATIVE Act. And it, NATIVE is an acronym in this uh, term, and it stands for Native American Tourism Improving Visitor Experience. And the point of the bill was actually to connect tribes to the federal agencies that work on tourism. Um, so for the first few years of the bill, uh, the funding came through uh, the Bureau of Indian Affairs was going out to tribes and to the American Indian Alaska Native Tourism Association, which is kind of the umbrella advocacy organization for um, uh, Native American tourism products in the U.S. And they're actually who is sponsoring the, concert, the conference that I'm at right now. Um, but, you know, a, most of the land that the Forest Service manages is um, ceded tribal land and still sacred land to most of the tribes. Uh, and so, you know, we do our due diligence, and again, it is written into our laws that we take tribal opinions and needs into consideration on our land management. We haven't always been great at it. Um, we are getting better. And in 2021, uh, the Forest Service was actually given a million dollars uh, to work with our tribes specifically on tourism. And we had a lot of really wonderful successes. Um, reintroducing traditional, like uh, on the Nez Pierce Historic Trail, we reintroduced the Nez Pierce names for a lot of the places and on several of our national forests. 
Uh, it's given us an ability to um, include more um, tribal interpretation in our visitor centers so that you are getting the full story about the place that you're visiting and not just the story about when white people showed up. Um, and so, yeah, it's been very successful. And it happens to be the kind of tourism that our emerging tourists, our younger folks are looking for. They want an authentic experience. They want something that is different than where they come from. They wanna experience a different culture and have an authentic experience. And in the United States, there's really no better way to do that than you know, taking a visit to one of our tribes. And um, you know, parts of our national parks are, are co-managed by some of our tribes. Uh, we make a lot of uh, management decisions in collaboration with our tribes. We also do, they help us decide which places we don't want visitors. Um, a lot of these sacred sites are not to be visited by folks outside of those tribes. And so, yes, they really do have an impact. Um, and again, you know, the current administration has put a really wonderful focus on making sure that we're providing equitable opportunities for tribes to weigh in on the decisions we make. And so as we talked about, you know, kind of establishing those networks and the processes, I hope that that will continue into the future. Yep. And then to build on that, you know, I think, you know, here at the Colorado Tourism Office, this is an emerging opportunity, I would say, for us. Um, we've started discussions with the Colorado Council of Indian Affairs here. We actually have a representative within OEDA that's specifically staffed to kind of create and be a liaison between. Um, I can say that, you know, my previous state, Oregon, where I worked, um, there's a lot of really good headway on kind of integrating, you know, tribal tourism into the conversation. Um, you know, I think there's a huge opportunity to tell the tribal story. Um, and I think just to build on what Toby has mentioned, I mean, this is, we're seeing travel trend towards experiential. We're seeing it trend towards sense of place. We're seeing it trend towards kind of like immersing yourself like a local if you will. And I was part of some legislation that got passed last, last year, HB 221382. Again, it sounds robotic. I swear it's real. Um, but it was, uh, we received funding to launch a Colorado Dark Sky certification mentor program. Um, so we'll be awarding up to four kind of 50 hour technical assistance grants later this year, uh, working with the International Dark Sky Association to help locations advance certification strategies and really protect access to the night sky and develop tourism opportunities related to it. And selfishly, um, what drives me in this space is that I want to find common ground with the tribes and find some way to organize tours to allow them to educate folks like me <laughs> about their interpretation of the night sky. You know, I'm always kind of flabbergasted that, you know, I lived in New Zealand for a while, as I mentioned, and I can go there across the world and there's common cultural connection because we see the Big Dipper, we see Orion, and I can share that with, with them. Our neighbors, the original inhabitants of our country, you know, have their own interpretation of the night. And I think we're just missing a chance to connect with them. Um, and I think we're missing a chance to learn more about everything that they have to offer and share with us and the oral history that makes the U.S. what it is. Awesome. We we have two more minutes, so I guess we can take one more question. And this is very interesting from the conference app. Um, so the question is, what impact will the rise of the metaverse have on the tourism industry? How should tourism products be transformed in the digital economy? And can NFT dissolve the homogeneity of tourism products? Thanks for asking. I'll start with this one. Um, <laughs> you'd be yeah. incredibly, you'd be incredibly surprised. Our partners in Southeast Colorado, out of La Junta, are in many ways leading in this space. Um, from at least I see in Colorado. So, um, we did a program with them last year where you know their cultural history is really significant, and I think a primary motivator for travel to Southeast Colorado, Sand Creek Massacre site, Ben's Old Fort, um, Amachi, which is the newest national historic site that got designated. Um, I think the formal launch will happen maybe next year, fingers crossed, um, of that. Um, and what we did was we hired local artists to depict, um, to make artwork from the past. And then we built a tourism website that educated people on the artwork and the history and really inspired them to travel to place. And the artwork is going through the welcome centers of Southeast Colorado right now. Um, 
we did take photos and there is a plan to release NFTs about the artwork um, to really drive it into kind of a tourism concept. And then the funding would go back to the nonprofit group that um, manages tourism for the region. So we're, you know, in experimentation mode, but we are playing around with NFTs in Southeast Colorado. And then we gave the same folks a grant uh, last year through our tourism management grant program. Um, they're looking at developing augmented reality experiences. And what attracts me is that there are certain folks that don't have the financial means or the accessibility means to go to these places. We are taking 360 photography, putting it on a website with different pins on the images to teach you about the history of, of the place. So not quite metaverse. I don't know if I'm ready to go there, um, but I do think we are playing around with augmented reality so that when you get to a place like Sand Creek Massacre and there's not enough workforce to give you the tour again. Great opportunities to apply for a job with with the uh, with the uh, feds. But if you if you were to go to Sand Creek Massacre here in the next few months, you can meet the ranger at the um, kind of welcome area to get kind of lay of the land. But you can walk around with your phone and view the same thing you're looking at, and then click on points of interest to get a virtual tour. All right, I think we're right on time. <laughs> Thank you very much to all the panelists. Uh, I believe uh, the, the attendees and I have learned a lot and I really enjoyed your talk, uh, talking about um, from different perspectives, from industry, from the federal government, from the state government. It is very informative. Thank you very much.